Welcome everyone. Thanks for your patience. We always try to let a few minutes go by. Um, and Noah is about to come up. Noah is back on stage. Excellent. So uh, again, welcome everyone to uh, our fourth Sindig in the Leading Voices in Higher Education series. Um, I am delighted, delighted, truly, truly delighted to have Noah Brown, uh, the President and CEO of the Association of Community College Trustees, ACCT, as our guest today. Um, I know some of you in the room, and I know that some of you in the room have participated in shindigs before, but let me go ahead and remind everyone how to engage. Um, this is meant to be a participation event, not a lecture. And so if you look at the uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, a question mark. And that is if you want to text in a question, there is a hand, and if you raise your hand, that means that we can bring you actually up on stage with us to ask a question uh, in person, on screen. And um, there is a woman sort of behind the curtain here that's in a little window on the left side of my screen anyway, named Tara Peitzer, who works for Shindig. And she's really the magic behind this whole uh, enterprise, but she's... Uh, uh, she and Shindig have been just terrific and obviously can't say enough about how much they have enabled us to be able to do something like this. So um, Noah and I are going to engage in a conversation about uh, community colleges. And um, you saw sort of the teaser that went out about the conversation. But again, if you have questions, by all means, please ask. Um, before we begin, I want to say thank you to uh, Dale Campbell and uh, the University of Florida Institute for Higher Education, as well as um, Sissy Carroll, who's the Dean of the UCF College of Education and Human Performance, if uh, they have been the sponsors for this event. And uh, again, I'm very grateful. And Dale, congratulations again on your retirement. Um, you will be sorely missed, but, but certainly uh, we know where to find you, so don't go too far. Um, Noah, why don't you give us an overview of ACCT for those that, that aren't familiar with it? Okay, well, thank you, Greg. First of all, thank you for inviting me to join you and, and folks today. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Greg knows I teach online, so this is sort of familiar to me. And I'm pleased to see that uh, there are a couple people who have joined us that I think I know or may have heard me. But if you don't know, um, the Association of Community College Trustees, uh, we were founded in 1972. We are the organization that is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're a national not-for-profit association. And our membership are the boards of community, technical, and junior colleges throughout the U.S. and a few other places around the world. And we have sister relationships with other organizations, for example, in the United Kingdom and the like. Uh, but we work directly with boards of community colleges, and boards of community colleges are either elected, uh, like school board members are appointed, usually by the governor, or in some cases the mayor, or maybe a county executive. Um, there's about 6,000 of them in the country, uh, presiding over approximately 1,132 uh, colleges. These are all regionally accredited, not-for-profit, uh, two-year institutions, or we also represent state boards uh, that may include community colleges, such as uh, Minnesota, uh, Louisiana, Alabama, and the like. Um, we focus really in three ways. Uh, first, uh, we focus a lot on uh, education and effective governance, so we help boards and trustees understand their role. Uh, both as advocates and as policymakers. We obviously represent uh, all of our boards here in Washington, D.C., as Greg knows. So we pay a lot of attention to the Congress, the White House, uh, federal agencies, and, and we have staff, uh, more staff now, Greg, than when you served on our board several years ago, uh, paying attention to all that. And then lastly, we have a number of services that we can provide to boards. We actually have an in-house uh, executive search service. So we help boards uh, find and hire presidents and chancellors and also vice presidents. 
Uh, we're available to work with boards in a strategic retreat setting. And we also can provide presidential and board self-evaluation uh, instruments. So it's a lot of things, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I think Tara has put a, something up on our website, but uh, you feel free to visit our website, take a look at what we're doing, particularly in public policy, where we've done a lot of research on cutting edge issues, uh, some of which I think we'll probably talk about today. So that's mm -hmm. ACCP in a nutshell. So, and Noah, um, on a public policy side, for those of you who are not familiar with his background, was the head of public policy for ACCT before becoming president uh, 13 years ago, right, Noah? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, my whole career, so, as Greg knows, has been in advocacy and public policy. Right. And, um, and so for somebody who can be a strong advocate for uh, community colleges and in higher education in general, having somebody with Noah's background being uh, the CEO of one of the leading higher education organizations in DC makes a, makes a big difference. So um, he, he's, he's definitely known throughout Washington. Um, you talked about these uh, 1,132 colleges, and uh, one of the things I really enjoyed, and I guess by disclosure, I should have said that I was on the board um, between 2006 and 2010, and it was a fantastic experience. I really enjoyed it and, frankly, miss it, Noah. Um, but uh, the diversity of how those trustees got to be trustees and how they got to be on the ACCD board, for that matter, um, just amazed me. So I was wondering if you could explain the diversity that you have within the membership and, and how trustees become trustees. Yeah, well, it is, it is uniquely American, uh, this system of governance that we have in community colleges. I've been in a few other places around the world, and nobody has what we have in terms of allowing essentially lay citizens, people drawn from communities, to come into service on boards. So there are 50 states, as you know, and probably more than 50 different ways of organizing governance in the community uh, college sector. But basically, um, if you look at all of the trustees uh, that we work with, uh, about two thirds of them are actually appointed trustees. Um, and only a third are actually directly elected. Now you have some exceptions, but generally speaking, uh, almost all the boards um, that are east of the Mississippi tend to be appointed boards. And then as you move across the country uh, with the development of the democracy and so forth, you'll see more elected boards. Uh, but again, you have variations within. And then you have variations in some states. Um, for example, in Illinois, uh, all the community colleges in Illinois, with the exception of those in the city of Chicago, all those board members are elected by the public. The seven colleges that make up the city colleges of Chicago, uh, those board members are all appointed by the mayor of Chicago. And I guess that makes sense if you know anything about Chicago politics and the relative power of Chicago mayors. So you have exceptions. And then in New York State, you have essentially three different governance systems, somewhat in, interrelated, but not exactly. So in the city of New York, in the boroughs, you have the City uh, University of New York, which is a blended four-year, two-year system governed by a board which is uh, by and large appointed by the mayor of New York. But then if you move out of New York City, uh, there are about there are 30 uh, community colleges with locally appointed board members, uh, either through the county exec or some combination. But then sitting on top of that, you have the State University of New York system, which represents essentially the senior institutions. But interestingly, SUNY, is the one that has the sign off on the local board's choice of who they want as a president. So you have a kind of a shared system where the local boards deal with budget primarily and local uh, politics, but the state board is the one that ultimately approves their selection as, as the president uh, for their colleges. So there's a lots of different ways 
that you might come into a board in community colleges. I think the defining hallmark, as I alluded to, is that everybody on a community college board is essentially a volunteer, uh, generally someone that's been fairly active in their community or in politics. Some of them are former educators. A lot of them are small business owners or active in their chamber or other related not-for-profits. Uh, but they're drawn to this uh, by uh, a love of service and a desire to give back. And uh, I think that's what allows ACCT really to work with all of them because we have those kinds of values, I think, in common across the entire uh, sector of higher of uh, community college education. Yeah. And, and community colleges didn't come into being until the beginning of the 20th century, right? So it was 1900 with Joliet Junior College, if I remember my history, Trump. but... That, that's correct, yeah. 1901 is generally acknowledged as the birth of what we consider the modern community college, uh, Joliet Junior College. Um, although the Alamo Community College District in Texas has one of its colleges, uh, it's now a community college, but it actually started uh, about 50, 75 years uh, earlier than Joliet. So they like to think of themselves as the earliest, although they didn't become a community college until later. So, but we saw a boost in community colleges, uh, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, where this explosion really happened. And I guess people forget that it was the Truman Commission that was calling for community colleges to, to grow and to be free. Uh, so the free community college movement began in 1947, or at least the call for it anyway. Um, yeah. Complicating things on top of that, you have now a lot of community colleges uh, making this migration into offering baccalaureate degrees, which I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, Florida certainly is, is a good test case for how this is going. Well, you're right. So if you go back and you trace the history of our movement, um, there certainly were community colleges beginning in 1901, but the growth was rather small. A lot of them uh, were sort of uh, outgrowths of high schools, uh, career technical schools, and the like. Uh, just as an aside, in California, uh, you still have a few uh, leaders of colleges in California who have the title president and superintendent. The term wow. superintendent being a throwback to uh, our origins from the high school movement. But yeah, Greg, what happens uh, near the end of the Second World War, as you know, we have the GI uh, Opportunity, uh, Service Member Opportunity Bill that was signed in 1944. And then at the end of the war, we had uh, well over 2.2 million primarily men coming back from the European theater of war in the Pacific. And we needed to figure out how to integrate them into the economy. Remember that this was only uh, a few years after the Great Depression. And there was a fear that all these returning service members, most of whom had little to no formal education, uh, would essentially crash the economy. So for that and other reasons, President Truman organized a commission on the future of higher education, which came out with a report, as you said, in 1947 and among the many recommendations was that we had to build out and invest in our higher education system so that we could more fully integrate citizens in this country and not only uh, strengthen our own economy, but help uh, Europe uh, restore its economy and build a prosperous uh, peacetime world. And one of the interesting recommendations, as you mentioned, was this notion that K through 14 education should be both universal and free which we're only getting back to now. And we can talk about that, I think, probably in a minute or two. But yes, beginning after 1947, tremendous growth. I'm told by colleagues that in the late 50s and 1960s, uh, we were probably opening a community college every week somewhere in this country. And of course, the other thing, Greg, in those days, the Congress actually put money into uh, building higher education facilities through the old Title VII of the Higher Education Act. Uh, we've gotten uh, gotten out of the business, but certainly in the 60s, 70s, just about up to the early 80s, uh, there was a deliberate uh, and intentional investment to build out the system. 
So we are a relatively new system in terms of growth. And uh, we have now grown to the point where we serve approximately half of all the undergraduate students in American higher education. So a remarkable story. Absolutely. I mean, that is about as American a success story as you'll get. The question I have for you, though, is on the financial side, is how sustainable is this system in the current environment? Well, you know, that's something I worry a lot about. And uh, I'm sure you and everybody online with us today has read any number of stories or reports about the growing anxieties about the cost of higher education and is higher education delivering the quality product that people believe it needs to deliver. And of course, in our sector, uh, we've been criticized uh, pretty robustly uh, the, the past few years about not uh, producing enough college graduates or not transferring enough uh, students to four-year institutions. Some of it is deserved, some of it not deserved. Uh, it's complex. But yeah, I worry a lot about uh, the sustainability of the system generally. You know, we, for, for good reasons, as I said, uh, we made um, the decision to invest a lot of money in growing our higher education system after the Second World War. And, uh, you know, just look at the results. I mean, look how fast our economy grew. Look at how many more people we propelled into teaching, uh, into medicine, into law, into engineering, into sciences. I mean, frankly, up until the early 70s, we were on fire in this country in terms of uh, delivering on the promise of higher education. What happens in the mid 70s up to the present time is we start slipping back, some of which is due to the fact that we stopped investing at the same pace that we had before, even though clearly we were investing a lot in higher education. But what happens, Greg, is it's shifting. The, the locus of investment has shifted. At one time, the states were the primary investor in higher education and student aid. That's no longer true. Now the federal government is the majority stakeholder in investing in higher education, particularly student aid, which is why I would say that Congress has gotten increasingly interested in outcomes. What are they getting for all the Pell dollars and things that they're putting out there? And I think they're legitimate questions. I also know that uh, if you look at international comparisons uh, between the U.S. and other countries, uh, we used to be first in the world uh, when it came to the proportion of 18 to 34-year-olds, or excuse me, 25 to 34-year-olds uh, with a college degree. Um, we actually slipped to about 16th uh, a few years ago. We've managed to struggle back to 13th place. But, you know, if we are the richest, most prosperous nation on the planet and we're only in 13th place relative to the proportion of uh, Americans with a college degree, it gets right to your question again, which is, is this really sustainable over the long term? So and I want to remind people, remind people um, um, that they can certainly ask questions, ask questions and ask questions. And, and since since you did mention first in the world, Noah, um, this is an excellent book for anybody interested in community colleges, uh, authored by uh, J. Noah Brown. So I encourage you to go on Amazon and pick up a copy. It's a great read. Thanks, Greg. Checks in the mail. So, um, so let me ask you about this then, Noah. So you've had, uh, you look at what's happening in Georgia and community colleges getting rolled into to the four years. Um, you look, you look at uh, what Wisconsin is proposing with merging the whole system. So, what does what does that portend for community colleges going forward? Well, you know, again, it is cause for concern, and you could throw in there also, Greg, that the uh, Northeast Accrediting Commission just, uh, I think, yesterday or the day before, rejected. Uh, uh, the state of Connecticut's proposal to roll its community college system into the university system fully. So there is a lot of conversation. And I think a lot of it is driven by the increasing costs of higher education, number one. And number two, uh, 
a lot of hand wringing again about are we getting what we invest in in terms of outcomes? Are we getting uh, people through with quality degrees or quality certificates? Um, you know, for the last five or six years, Greg, the Department of Labor has come out with the almost exact same statistic, which is that there are about 5.7 or 5.6 million good jobs in this country that go unfilled every year. These are not necessarily uh, requiring a four-year degree, but certainly require uh, quality skills and credentials. And so, you know, you have numbers like that and you have employers who say they have a tough time finding quality individuals to uh, take up the jobs that they have. So people naturally start asking questions. How is it that we can be investing you know, $180 billion a year uh, in federal student, student aid programs, just to name one uh, statistic, and we can't fill 5.7 million jobs in this country that require some uh, modicum of, of technical uh, or higher skills. Right. So people say that the goal of higher education shouldn't exclusively be to get a job, but my experience with community colleges is that it's exactly what it is, is about getting a job, unless they're on a, on a transfer pathway. Well, that's true by and large. I mean, obviously, as you know, um, a lot of our colleges we would call comprehensive. So they have a lot more than just uh, career technical vocational. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, over 16 states now, including Florida, where this really began, allow community colleges to offer a four-year degree. Now, there are lots of reasons for doing it. In Florida, I think the original reason, and you probably know better than I, Greg, uh, the original reason is there was a concern that the four-year institutions were not producing enough teachers. And so the initial foray, I think, for the colleges was to be approved to offer um, degrees in, in teaching up um, the amount of teachers available in the state of Florida. Well, uh, fast forward to the present, uh, now the legislature and others are, are wondering if there isn't an overproduction uh, of four-year degrees because the community colleges, in addition to teaching, they got into uh, applied health sciences and all the rest. You know, this is the history of higher education. You know, Greg, is that it's it's, uh, it's, it's uh, either scarcity or abundance. Same thing in public education. We build lots of buildings when the enrollments are going up. And then when the enrollments decline, which by the way, they're starting to do again, we have all these empty school buildings. Uh, same is true in community colleges and higher education. Um, there is no, um, there's no regularized system. So it is a huge laissez-faire a system of education, and sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't. We have a question, have a question. Uh, from my colleague at UCF. So, Tari, you want to bring? There you go. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Dr. Martini. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, how are you? Um, very interesting conversation. I um, am the faculty and program coordinator for the Career and Tech Ed Teacher Education Program at UCF. Uh, so I was interested in what you had to say. Um, it is it is concerning about the community colleges in Florida. They are being swallowed up by the state colleges, and then you have technical centers that are being swallowed up by. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I guess that's a strong word, but a uh, term, but. Uh, taken over by the school boards. So a lot of the CTE teachers are are getting um, you know put into these other pathways that they. Uh, um, that they didn't anticipate and they're scrambling to get certifications and whatnot. Um, have you heard any co conversations in your dealings across the country on CTE teacher preparation um, uh, requirements or requirements or uh, you know hiring practices or such? What's going on out there in the country? Besides, I know what's going on here in Florida, but what, what else is going on out there? Well, uh, you know, What's going on in Florida is what's going on in most places. There's a lot of conversation. Again, I think it's, it's driven by the fact that we have such a decentralized system, which on the one hand I would say is part of its strength, but on the other hand,
creates these issues and imbalances mm -hmm. between supply and demand. You know, the big conversation in community colleges, frankly, uh, in addition to student success and completion, which is how we can up our game in getting students successfully across the finish line, whether it's a degree or certificate or certainly in Florida and other places, transfer to a senior institution, is a rethinking of how we approach career and technical and how we prepare people for the world of work. And so you'll hear lots of conversations, particularly driven by employers right now, about badging, stackable credentials, um, the whole issue of uh, competency-based education. In other words, are we looking in the wrong places in terms of, of how do we know if we're preparing people adequately? So there's a lot of conversation. And at the same time, as I'm sure you know, so many of our colleges are so deeply into the K-12 education world at this point. Uh, talk about dual enrollment, uh, mm -hmm. community college high schools. Um, you know, the, the tragedy with that is that on the one hand, I'm glad that we can do it. But on the other hand, um, it is a complete blurring of the mm -hmm. traditional uh, lines between our sectors. And frankly, when we're educating high school students, uh, the high schools are getting the money, not the community colleges, right. uh, which only adds to our financial woes. And I would suggest is going to create a lot of flashpoints uh, between all of our uh, sectors in higher education. And um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, yeah, right. I mean, it's... There, you know, I worry a lot about these things. You know, you could step back, as I do occasionally, just step back and ask yourself a simple question. What's the purpose of all of this? And how could we organize it simply? Well, that's the easy part. Then when you look at how it's evolved and how interrelated and complex it is, where do we start? Where do we mm -hmm. start peeling it apart and really creating a better economies of scale and better return on investment? Um, Greg Can knows I I'm a philosopher by training. This is the stuff that keeps me up at nights because on the one <laughs> hand, it's not that complicated, but on the other hand, we're swimming upstream against huge bureaucratic systems that are steeped right. in the status quo and their own culture. And, you know, Florida has been having a lot of fun down there between the uh, legislature <laughs> getting rid of developmental ed and one thing and the other. Um, we're waiting to see how you guys figure it out, frankly. Right. Well, that is true. Florida is pretty um, progressive in in that sense. But the um, we have this um, we have in to prepare CTE teachers. We have four classes um, that are required for CTE teachers to teach in the secondary levels. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of teachers um, who who have masters and bachelors uh, require these individual courses that are undergraduate level uh, for their professional teaching license. I actually have all the different kinds of levels in my classes because they're, uh, you know, all of a sudden, and, and we have 67 school districts in Florida and they each have their own rules. So that's fun. And, <laughs> and they, they tell their CTE teachers what they need. Um, so they're all starting to, uh, you know, come to me, <laughs> which is great. But I was just, you know, and, and it's interesting that you said competency based. Uh, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I'm going to I'm going to be attending uh, presenting in, in Italy in the fall with my uh, colleague from Finland. And we're doing a comparison of our CTE teacher preparation pathways uh, and they use a competency based assessment um, type of system and they're kind of almost aligned with uh, Germany, but uh, in the PISA scale, they are in the top five uh, in the world in their educational uh, structure and organization. And, and um, so they're, they're pretty big out there. So they're, it's, it's going to be exciting uh, conversation to have. Um, but all of their teachers in Finland have master's degrees. Um, and even the uh, even the preschool teachers have master's degrees, and and uh, the CTE uh, all teachers are uh, civic employees, um, so they're um, they're all um, part of the you know the government system. But um, so they're they're all but they they don't actually make more than we do. They're just more respected 
Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was so strange, yeah. but uh, they they make the same amount of money that teachers in America make, um, but they are they are much more respected. Uh, so it's it's just a, a a matter of culture, and that we have to um, we have to have that conversation of just starting, you know, t to understand where CT vocational education community colleges fit in our in our economy. Um, you know, certainly everybody who goes to school is not independently wealthy and doesn't, you know, everybody needs a job basically. So uh, whether it's, a, you know, a job with a degree in bachelor's or master's or higher, everyone's going for a job. So, um, you know, it all trickles down, I think, but it's an important conversation. Um, what, what other types of things do you do in your organization? You know, you talked about governance and, and but what do you do exactly? Like if somebody just wants your help with something, what is it? What does that look like? Let me, um, let me interject because I'm actually going to get into that, but I have another question okay. that I want to pose to to Noah first. So, thank you. We will we will come back to that. Okay. Um, Noah, there was a question asked. Um, I guess Tom was being shy, but he wanted to know why community colleges are not understood by the legislators particularly in spite of so much the community colleges have done to the families, the economy, and the nation. Yeah, I mean, I get asked this all the time, and I wonder about it myself. I'm not sure I have a really good answer. I'm not sure why this is the case. I can give you some theories. So theory one is, and Greg knows because we have a, a national legislative summit here in Washington, D.C. every February, and Greg might remember in the back of the program of that meeting, and by the way, we have a thousand presidents and trustees that come to Washington to lobby Congress. In the back of that program, we out members of Congress that have some kind of a community college uh, background. They don't put it on their resume, but we find out. Either they went to a community college, they got an associate's degree, there might be somebody like Greg who was actually a trustee, they may have taught at a community college. They may have a family member. Um, so I think the first problem is that um, most of the people uh, that make policy decisions in this country, whether it's Congress or the legislature, still um, the, ma the majority of them have no experience with a community college. They didn't attend one. They don't know what it is. Uh, their perception may be the old perception that, you know, community colleges are for, for students that are not smart or, you know, who want to take basket weaving or whatever, but that's not where you go, quote unquote, uh, to get a good education. I would say the second thing, which I spend a lot of time thinking about is why do we not do as well as four-year universities when it comes to getting legislatures to throw money at us? And I thought a lot about this, and I think part of it is historical, that uh, at one time in our history, we were, uh, as I suggested earlier, kind of the new darlings, right? There was tremendous growth, tremendous investment, tremendous energy. That kind of peaked out in the 70s. A lot of other things came about. Uh, we continued to uh, toot our own horns, uh, deservedly so, but I think it's somewhere down the line, maybe legislatures and others have decided we were doing just fine, thank you very much, and they didn't need to worry about investing as much in us because they had other competing priorities. Uh, so I think that's a problem. And then the other, I would say, is the simple conundrum of status, right? If you think about higher education, uh, people tend to think about certain institutions and they have, they have status. We've never managed to elevate ourselves to having status uh, the way that Ivy League colleges and others do, even though uh, all of the studies that uh, we've read or been part of show that uh, the return on investment in community colleges in terms of public dollars is immense, much bigger than most state universities and certainly Ivies. But you know, nobody really wants to believe it, right? Everybody wants to go to Harvard. Everybody wants to, you know, uh, have fond memories of the football team or the basketball team. I, I sometimes joke with presidents that, you know, perhaps you should get a big time football program 
and then maybe legislatures would uh, listen to you more intently. So it's complex, but you know we are still the relative newcomers in the higher education world, and uh, I think in some cases we've been our own worst advocates. We have not been willing to go face to face with universities and others to say, "Hey, we're just as good as you. We're just different. That's all." I always felt that community colleges were sort of the Rodney Dangerfield of higher education, but uh... yeah, it's true. So, but you know whose fault? Whose whose fault is that? Right. So, but do you think that part of the problem challenge that community colleges have um, similarly is shifting the burden of funding? So, for states, they were looking at at higher ed writ large as an opportunity to shift funding onto the students because there was that option. For community colleges, there's an additional option because the localities provide funding. And so the states can can try to shift more of the burden onto the locals so that they don't have to cover that that part of the expense. Is that something you've noticed? Well, I mean, that's true in a, in a variety of states. Again, as you know, how community colleges um, access public dollars it differs from state to state. But yes, yeah, at one time, uh, in, where you had community colleges where the state was the majority funder or the majority funder partner and you were incentivized for enrollment, right? Um, states contributed the lion's share and then you had in some cases uh, local dollars, uh, maybe through uh, millages or a bond referenda or property taxes and so forth. So it is true. So for example, uh, in Arizona, uh, if you look at the Maricopa uh, Community College District uh, in and about Phoenix, one of the largest districts in America, um, their percentage of state-based revenues, I think, have at this point are well below 10% of their total revenue. Uh, whereas, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they may have been somewhere around 30 to 35%. Well, but on the other hand, uh, they're getting 30 or 40 percent, I believe, uh, in terms of local uh, funding. So what you're saying is correct, Greg, that, that states uh, and state legislatures uh, are clever sometimes. And if there's an opportunity to, uh, to shift the burden elsewhere, uh, quietly, you know, systematically, you know, it's like the old frog in the pot. They turn up the heat very slowly, hope nobody notices. We've seen this across uh, states. Um, we have, uh, last time I looked at the numbers, Greg, um, across our entire sector, we've lost more than 20% uh, of our total revenues uh, from state sources. Wow. So state revenues are plummeting. Uh, this, by the way, is why the feds have, have increased uh, their investment in student aid. And, you know, I plead guilty. I've spent 25 years lobbying the federal government to increase all that, right? Um, which I still think is good. But uh, the downside is that the feds now, uh, by about 62%, are the majority shareholder. So now we got Washington sticking its nose under our tent and asking lots of questions. And the states are kind of skipping away, uh, investing elsewhere. Now, it's, it's very complicated. I'm simplifying. But the feds also shifted, as you know, Greg, a huge a burden for Medicare and other things on the backs of the states and right. pension funds and all that. So the states are strapped. There's been some recovery, but we will never, uh, probably in my working life, see a state investment uh, get anywhere near the level it was before the Great Recession uh, in 2008. So while there's been some recovery, we're not even close to being back to where we were. Yeah. So, Tara, we had a question. Oh, yeah. Should I read the question? So the question is, can this be standardized? Why is the need of having why is the need of having different requirements for teachers to get licensed? 
Well, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I'm not in the teacher certification business, but I could opine and suggest, uh, like with all of higher education, we rejected uh, sometime after the Articles of Confederation were adopted, this concept of having a nationalized system of anything, right? Even our accreditation system, we have seven regional accrediting bodies that accredit colleges and universities across the country. They have a lot of similarities in their standards, but they're not all the same either. So I think the answer is we have never, um, well, I should say we have never, we seem to reject the notion of having a one size fits all or a standard uh, set of licensure requirements or anything else for that matter. I think the, uh, uh, the Dean from Central Florida, Greg was starting to ask that question in part, which is, um, why do they have all these different requirements? You know, the big tragedy, in my opinion, is if you look at uh, public school teachers, particularly in the high schools, how many of the teachers in high schools that teach math and English actually have a baccalaureate degree in, in either of those subjects? You know, something to think about. Of course, I got another one for you, uh, which is one of my favorite rants, which is why don't the community colleges uh, engage in joint faculty development in the summer with high school teachers. Why don't we put our math and English faculty in rooms with the high school math and English teachers and get on the same page so that when the students come out of high school, they're college ready and we don't have to spend all that money uh, in remediation, which as we all know is usually a failure. Most of the kids that get stuck in remediation never make it out or worse, end up failing the same course three times over. And then I don't know where they go after that. This reminds me of a lot of late night conversations after ACCP board meetings. So yes, we, um, well, we have I haven't another, fixed them yet either, Greg. We have another question uh, to pop up on screen. Has there been talk about connecting community colleges with local businesses for financial support, apprenticeships, et cetera? Well, the answer is yes, and that talk's not new. I mean, if you go back, um, community colleges, to a greater or lesser extent, have always been tied closely to local employers and businesses. We do a lot of contract training. Uh, we have generally been seen as the educator of first choice because of our ability to ramp up programs quickly and be flexible. Um, most of our colleges are at this point uh, fairly reliant on adjunct faculty. A lot of those adjunct faculty come from the employers or businesses. So we actually have people teaching who actually can walk the walk in terms of what they're teaching. But apprenticeship, yeah, um, you may know that the new administration uh, is placing a lot of emphasis on getting us back into a more systematic apprenticeship a model. Uh, the dean from Central Florida alluded to uh, our friends in Europe. Well, they never left the apprenticeship model, and they're way ahead of us in some ways. For some reason, about 25 years ago, we decided apprenticeship was bad, and we dumped it. So now we're re-looking at that. And so, for example, the administration and the Congress recently uh, I think to the tune of $60, uh, 60 million dollars, uh, has created a program, a grant program to incentivize colleges and others to form apprenticeship opportunities with local employers. So, you know, we're moving in that direction now, but the, I guess for me, the question is, why did we leave that world 25 years ago in the first place? Maybe that's why we have 5.7 million jobs that go unfilled every year. Again, I'm haunted by the fact that I don't find the I don't find the questions complex, but we just ignore them, or we find reasons why we can't deal with those questions because A, B, C, and D. But again, apprenticeship is something that works pretty well, has been shown to work extremely well, particularly in European countries, and we made a decision to uh, ignore it for a time being, and now we're all in a panic and uh, figuring out how to get back in, you know, after after the clock's been running for how many years. I don't I feel strongly back. about this, by the way. You don't feel strongly about anything. No, um, it's true, it's one of my faults. 
I want to get back to this this 62% number that you threw out about the federal share of funding, which I did not realize it had grown to that level. So that brings us to discussing the Higher Education Act or authorization. Um, given the federal stake in how we operate and how we're funded, can you talk about not necessarily the PROSPER Act, and obviously it's it's the one on the table right now, but sort of right. what's your goal? Out of the out of the reauthorization, where you see it headed? Yeah, well, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, we have um, a package in the House called the Prosper Act. Um, they continue to hold hearings and and discussion. Uh, we've submitted all matter of comments about it, um, but I think the big issues for us. Uh, whether it's PROSPER or the Higher Ed Act reauthorization generally, is first and foremost, um, we are still trying to convince Congress uh, to come up with a common sense approach to laddering up the Pell Grant program relative to inflation. You know, the good news is, Greg, uh, last year we got, um, or I should say earlier, uh, well, late last fall, we got the restoration of the year-round Pell Grant. You know, we, we got that a couple years ago, and then in, in about a year's time, Congress knocked it out, which caused all sorts of disruption. Uh, but we got it back, and we hope it stays, because we believe this is an important strategy for propelling a student completion and persistence, because now students can go year-round and continue their trajectory. And we know, Greg, that if we can get students to complete at least 12 to 16 credit hours, the likelihood that they're going to finish a degree or certificate goes way up. So it's important to us. Another big issue that we worry about is uh, with respect to student loans, uh, the so-called cohort default rate problem. Very briefly, um, if an institution uh, has a cohort default rate of student loans uh, of 30% or more, uh, they can get into serious trouble with the uh, Department of Ed, and they could lose access to all federal funding. Well, the problem in the community college world, as you know, Greg, is that we don't have a huge number of borrowers relative to all of higher ed, but the, no the way that the numbers are calculated is ridiculous. So if, say, at your former uh, institution, NOVA, Northern Virginia Community College, suppose you had 30 borrowers of student loans, and uh, you know, 10 of them <laughs> defaulted. You'd be in trouble. That means that 10 borrowers who default at NOVA could cause NOVA to lose access to federal aid for all of its students, including the thousands of students that are probably uh, receiving Pell Grants at NOVA. That's a very uh, overly punitive step for a relatively small problem. Uh, and then related to that is an issue called risk sharing, which we're very uh, frightened about and spend a lot of time talking about. Risk sharing is the concept that the institutions ultimately would be on the line to repay those defaulted portfolios on behalf of students. Now, it varies tremendously, but we've got some schools, Greg, that could be looking at, you know, two and a half, three, five million dollars suddenly that they'd have to pony up. And the question really is, are the institutions completely at fault if students default? But my big concern that I worry about for boards is that, which is basically legal, is we are not the, uh, we are not the federal government. We aren't providing the loans. We aren't meeting out the loans. We aren't servicing the loans, but somehow now we're responsible for the whole deal. Well, that's not fair. That's really a huge unfunded mandate. So we worry a lot about risk sharing. And again, like Pell Grants and cohort default, we're trying to get some common sense here around uh, the, the, the twin principles of yes, we want to be accountable, but no, um, you can't punish us for things that we cannot control. So those are some. There are lots of other issues embedded. We're also interested in, in allowing Pell Grants for short-term 
uh, programs, uh, not unrelated to apprenticeship or others, because clearly we got to get people out in the workplace uh, and get them working and getting living wages and filling those 5.6, 5.7 million jobs. Do you worry that if they expand the federal financial aid program less than degree programs, you know, these coding camps they talk about and, and the like that um, you'll get a lot of fly by night outfits getting in there trying to, to build the system? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the current administration is rolling back uh, the restrictions uh, with the proprietary sector. And just recently, the Secretary of Education restored the status for the accrediting agency for the for-profit sector. So absolutely, I think we would be the first to say that while there is a value in extending Pell to short-term programs, there must be adequate safeguards because we're very much, very much concerned about fraud and abuse. And frankly, not enough people are talking about that. They seem to be seduced by the prospect of extending Pell to a variety of programs. But, you know, Greg, I've been around a long time, as you know, and this is not unlike the debate about distance education 20 years ago, which was this fear that if we allowed students to qualify for Pell taking courses online, there would be fraud and abuse. And Congress, in that instance, really dragged their feet on that issue for many years. So yes, we need safeguards in place. Um, otherwise, we're going to have a huge problem that could just further erode confidence, not only in our sector, but in higher ed, if there's a lot of fraud and abuse and misuse of federal investments. So I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, and let me see if there was a question. I didn't see one. Okay, so, um, and I'm glad you mentioned accreditation because I know you have an accreditation report you just came out with. Um, and I think uh, for those in the room that are interested and those who'll be watching this uh, after the fact, we record this for a YouTube uh, channel as well. Um, would certainly encourage them to go to your website and, and look at that report. You, you guys do just excellent analysis across the board. But you mentioned sort of this, this place that we're at now in the Trump administration that is very different than where community colleges were during the Obama administration. And that has forced us all, regardless of whatever sector we're in in higher education, uh, to have to adapt, but particularly for community colleges, because you had such an esteemed place in the Obama administration with Dr. Biden uh, being an instructor at, at NOVA um, and such a champion for community colleges. How have you, how have the trustees had to adapt to this new normal within the Trump administration? Well, it's an excellent question. And yes, it's different. They have different priorities and uh, they use language differently than we're accustomed to using. Um, I would say that it's a work in progress. I mean, first of all, as you know, the administration is, is yet to be fully staffed. You know, there's 160 uh, presidential senior appointments that need to be made in government. I frankly don't know how many have actually been made. And, and some of them that have been made, as you know, are now vacant again. So if you look at the Department of Ed, yeah, we have a Secretary of Ed. Uh, and we have a smattering of other people and career people. We do have a friend in the uh, Office of a Career uh, the Office of uh, Adult and Career and Technical Education, uh, Michael Wooten, who's actually a, one of your colleagues, former colleagues, a trustee from NOVA. So he gets it, um, but he doesn't have a lot of support. And uh, it's unclear yet what the administration's real agenda will be with respect to our sector. I mean, we know about apprenticeship uh, and we certainly are working with that. Uh, but all the other bits and pieces, um, it's unclear at this juncture. Um, but let me just say this, Greg. I mean, yes, we enjoyed uh, a good deal of prominence under the Obama administration. Uh, we got talked about a lot. We got included in a lot of things. 
a lot of great proposals, uh, most of which, as you know, unfortunately were never funded, um, but that's okay. Um, but I would say that for those of us in the sector, irrespective of the administration, it's our job to move and carry the banner forward. We shouldn't be looking to an administration or anyone else to do it. And I think we should trade off the, the, uh, the goodwill that was created uh, the last number of years and just move forward as best we can and uh, take no prisoners along the way. That is a great way to end this session. Take no prisoners. <laughs> so, um, again, I want to I want to thank you, Noah. We could continue this conversation for another hour, I'm sure. Um, but and we have. Uh, I think <laughs> we we have very much appreciate you being so generous with your time and your insights and and the leadership you've provided with ACCT over the last twenty two years. Um, does not go unnoticed nor unappreciated. So uh, for this former trustee and for all the current and former trustees that you have served over the years, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for coming today to the Shindig, and uh, we will keep you posted as we go forward. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, Greg. I enjoyed it. See you in cyberspace, everybody. <laughs>